Now, after a strong run all year, they're starting to look a bit wayward at the moment. But okay. uh, <laughs> I think, uh, look, I think we're in the tail end of, of this bull market. And, you know, maybe what we're seeing at the moment are some signs of the end of the calendar year. So liquidity is down a bit, volatility is up a bit, some of the investment flows have weakened. And I think there's some genuine concern out there that into next year, you have one of, one or two, one of two things potentially happening. You either have a, a pullback in liquidity, because that's clearly what's driven uh, the stock market to date, or you have some moderation in what we call the leading indicators. So some signs that the economic growth recovery is not maybe as, as strong as it, at, as it was predicted to be. And I think that concern is really what's weighing on investors' minds at the moment, which is why there's very few of them taking a big bet over the end of the year, and hence the, the fact that uh, the volatility indexes are up a bit and the liquidity indices are down a bit. Mm -hmm. Interesting points there. Towards the end of the bull market, volatility index up, liquidity index a little bit lower. When your well, views? Everyone can have the opinion about whether we're at the end of the bull market or not. Liquidity hasn't really lowered. I mean, the, the stock market is maybe 200 or 300 points. You know, it's less than 2% off its absolute, you know, peak since the recovery started. Since stock market, so I mean, it's still above 27,000. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's been no real weakness in the market whatsoever. But December is quiet. I mean, I think we've probably got another week. Next Friday will will really be the last trading day of the year. After that, there's nothing. Yeah, just just the point that he made, which was quite interesting. In, end of the bull market, I think a little bit too soon to call for that. Um, I, I certainly don't believe that. What I think's happened is that the bulk of the liquidity-driven gains may be behind us. Let's say we're two-thirds through that. Um, but now, Wayne alluded to a little bit earlier, we're starting to see some of the economic data come through stronger than anticipated. And I think we could see a fair section of that data come through stronger than expected. We're in the midst of a recovery that could gain traction. And bear in mind, we've got more stimulation that's been thrown at this global economy yeah, than ever. ever before. It's unprecedented, on an unprecedented scale. So the risk is that a lot of this data surprises to the upside and that people start to factor that into, into stock prices. George, we keep talking about excess liquidity sitting on the sidelines. Could you quantify that for us? Uh, How much no, is actually I actually can't, to be <laughs> quite honest with you. There's, yeah. there's so much of it. I mean, they were talking about five trillion, uh, central banks pumping in five trillion by the end of, of 2010. Uh, th that in itself is just a, a crazy amount. If you look at graphs of the Fed's balance sheet, you have a look at how much uh, debt uh, or, or credit that's being pumped into China. We, we're talking astronomical amounts. To try and quantify that across the globe right now, <coughs> I haven't done that study. I don't no, know look, if you guys have looked at look, it. Look, I mean, if, if, you, if you add up all the stimulation packages and all the liquidity that the central banks have pumped in, let's just pick a number. I mean, what's the odd trillion between Feds? I mean, let's just say five trillion. Mm. Okay. However, that is probably the smaller number over time. The real influence is zero interest yeah. rates. That's the big one. Yeah. The and other no, one dangerous. is actually the smaller one. Okay, so when do you expect things to, to really start stabilizing from these levels? You were talking about bubble, a bubble emerging in emerging yeah. markets. If I we, mean, firstly, we've got to see that burst. Before. Yeah, if, we look, if we look, put markets aside now, the economy is already over its worst and recovering worldwide. So that's an established fact already. Um, stock markets, if a bubble does develop, It'll do it very, very quickly. And I mean, if you take the, our experiences with the debt bubble, with the, 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 the Asian tiger bubble, uh, the, the savings and loans bubble, the dot com bubble, yeah. I mean, markets could do another 40, 50% before this thing bursts. Eh? Yeah. Okay, we t you, s you mentioned debt, and obviously debt is under the spotlight. We saw what happened in Dubai, uh, and markets a market little bit of a hiccup there in, in terms of the gains that we've been yeah. seeing. But we're seeing it relatively contained in that oh, region. Totally, yeah. um, Eastern European countries also under significant pressure at this stage. Talk of sovereign default, but the kind of sense that I'm getting is uh, we're not really seeing anyone uh, coming under pressure in terms of defaults. Everyone's always willing to bail someone else out. Isn't that the case now, George? Well, because I think there, there's so much systemic risk that comes out of uh, a country defaulting. Uh, bear in mind, with, with globalization, especially in Europe, where all of these countries have become intertwined within the Eurozone, on the fringes of the Eurozone, everybody trying to help each other, uh, they're all interconnected somehow. So you've got loans in one country standing uh, for, for um, houses in another. Uh, the, it's, it's no longer a clear-cut case of, one bank is, is focused only on one country. One bank can be exposed to multiple countries, and so you get that systemic risk coming through, and it's, it, and it's inadvisable not to have uh, some sort of a, a cooperation agreement between the central banks um, in Europe, for example. You mentioned Eastern Europe. Uh, to try and bail out these countries that are in desperate trouble because 
failure to do so opens up for systemic risk, which you really don't want. Which ends up in your backyard, yeah. But look, I mean, we've survived the, the, the almost a meltdown of the global financial system. We've survived that. Telling you the odd country default is not going to be much in comparison. Yeah. Quite frankly, but surely we're just building up again. A, a, exactly going right. back to the to the bubble territory thing that we were talking about, uh, all we're doing now is saving the economy and the world economy yeah, with, new, the with new debt. Yeah, yeah. we're deferring so the problem. Surely it it's up. different kind of debt. Eh? It's government debt. It's government yeah. debt is a lot more sustainable. You can mm -hmm. sustain significantly higher government debt levels than you can consumer or corporate debt for long time. So understand, it's a different kind of debt, but we are just deferring the problem. I mean, you literally. You know, it's, 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 it's like the alcoholic having a beer in the morning. You defer the problem. And that's what low interest rates are. We actually cut interest rates to zero, release an enormous amount of liquidity, save the world, but you pay the price later on. It's, but this is no different to what happened in the dot-com bubble. You pay the price later on, yeah. and then you just fix it with the same stuff that yeah. you fixed it previously. Yeah. Well, in I mean, words, let's, <laughs> let's have a look at Japan. It's exactly the same as the exactly. dot-com bubble. Japan, you, you have a look at Japan. Now, there, we, there we've had a lost decade. I, I would actually argue that we've had almost the last two decades. Yeah. But you have a look at their debt-to-GDP ratio. It's the highest, pretty much the highest in the world, at, at 200, odd, over 200 percent of GDP. They've been able to sustain that for a prolonged yeah, period of time. Years. The problem is, is that it traps liquidity and it traps funding that could be reallocated far more efficiently to better resources into companies that perhaps shouldn't be around, uh, perhaps not around at all or not around in their current form. And unfortunately, you get that inefficiency which continues to hold back the, the economy in question. And that's the cost. That right there is the cost. So it might not be a tangible cost in terms of huge job losses or another big recession or a lot of pain being taken in the financial markets, but it could be prolonged over a long period of time. You have a look at the Japanese stock market. It's been in a bear market for two decades yeah. now. Uh, it, it's it's been it. horrific. That is a destruction of value. And it's, come, it's been born out of largely the kind of monetary policies that I fear we are, are, are busy um, so in other looking words, at stimulus, at the moment. Because that's all the Japanese uh, economy has been embarking on, trying to yeah. bail out big companies Look, and are, banks. There are, there are some important differences between Japan and the rest of the world and between Japan in the early 90s sure. and the world now. Mm -hmm. But the overall theme is exactly the same. I mean, the general theme is exactly the same. But I mean, people mustn't think that this is something new. It is exactly what happened after the dot-com bubble. Do you think the US is headed in the same bubbles. direction as, as Japan? No, there are some differences. The US, the big difference between the US and Japan, take General Motors. They let it go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. at, at the, in, in America, the, the system is more efficient. You know, if inefficiencies disappear. In, in Japan, I mean, in essence, it was a housing bubble. Well, it was a stock market bubble as well, but the late 80s was a housing bubble. They kept the construction companies going forever by giving them government contracts. America, that didn't really happen. Mm. Yeah, and then national But there are banks. some differences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stephen Gunyan also asked Chris Mayer whether South Africa will continue attracting the big foreign investor inflows we've been uh, seeing and how South Africa compares to other emerging markets. We as a house, we're not very positive on South Africa relative to other emerging markets. So we, I think it's ranked 15th out of 20 emerging market economies or markets uh, by our emerging market strategist, Jonathan Garner. So he's, it's actually his biggest underweight in a global emerging market portfolio because the currency is too strong, there's some economic headwinds, you know, that kind of thing relative to Latin America and China where, you know, things are really kicking into gear because the stimulus packages there have worked very well. Um, having said that, and, and it's interesting you raise uh, the point about flows. Now, EMEA, which is what we define as sort of central time zone emerging markets, so Russia, Middle East, uh, Central Europe and, and Africa, the flows into those markets has been abysmal, really, or dismal, more than abysmal, dismal relative to the flows going into some of the Asian markets this year. So actually, I think EMEA stock, EMEA emerging market stocks in which South Africa would be included, look quite interesting into next year. You know, they've lagged the other emerging markets, so they're very cheap now. They're about 70% of the PE multiple mm -hmm. of those other emerging markets. And the flows into South Africa and other sort of EMEA-based emerging markets, while positive this year, and they look kind of good, they far cry from what's happened in Latin America and China. So if you have a pullback in liquidity and a bit of a rotation out of this high beta, very sexy kind of markets into something that's still got growth but a little bit more stable, South Africa actually looks quite interesting, as does sort of emerging markets in um, central time zones uh, for, for 2010.